Hey guys, I thought I'd show you my latest project. I haven't uploaded a video in a while since I've been spending pretty much all of my time on this project. This is an electron, a scanning electron microscope that I built uh, pretty much from scratch. And um, it's taken, I've had some of these parts in my garage for, for years, literally, but I've been spending uh, just about every weekend since January working on it. So a pretty involved project, and I'll just give you the basic overview and then show you what I accomplished today, which was actually a huge milestone for this project. And um, we'll see where we go from there. So what we have here is a vacuum chamber. This is a glass bell jar that seals onto a, an aluminum uh, plate here. And I'll just take the jar off so that we can take a look at what's inside. Okay, we have uh, three brass threaded rods, which just provide a support structure, and a bunch of copper piping, which allows a, uh, a channel to be formed from the top of this device to the bottom. And at the top, we have an electron gun, uh, very similar to the one that's in, in old-style uh, cathode ray tube TVs. So it fires electrons down the copper pipe and uh, slams those electrons into a sample, the thing that you're actually looking at, and then captures the uh, resulting signal, which is also in the form of electrons. And uh, eventually all this is displayed on an oscilloscope, which I'll, I'll show in a minute. So I'll, I'll probably end up making quite a few videos um, showing how this project works. This is really just a very, very brief overview, and uh, I'll get into more details later. So let's move in and I'll uh, start on those details. Okay, so we're looking at the top of the electron column. Uh, that is the electron gun at the top, which I'll take apart and, and show in a later video. Uh, it basically consists of a tungsten hairpin filament, so very similar to a filament in a tungsten light bulb, but it's not coiled. It's just a straight piece of wire that's bent into, into sort of an elbow shape. So the hot filament uh, boils off electrons through thermionic emission, and then there's a high voltage accelerating potential of about, about 5,000 volts. I, I can adjust it, but I, I think 5,000 has been a, a pretty comfortable number so far. Um, so those electrons come out of the electron gun in a mm, kind of a loose beam. Um, I found that with the geometries of my electron gun, I had about a about a one inch diameter spot uh, about 18 inches away. So that's you know, a fairly tight beam for, for just the electron gun. Uh, but to make a useful electron microscope, we need the beam to be much more focused. So as the electrons travel down the column, they encounter this, which is a, um, an electron lens. So by uh, exposing those moving electrons to a, a specific kind of electric field, they can be focused, uh, just like photons are focused when they move through a glass lens um, or any, le uh, any material that has a different refractive index than uh, the medium in which the lenses are set. Uh, this functions as a sort of uh, condenser lens. So the electrons that pass through here are focused to a point that's very close in the lens. So uh, the focal point uh, of this lens is right about here. So as the electrons come through here, they're focused to this point here and then diverge very, very sharply. And the point of this is to demagnify the image of the, from the electron gun. So this is a way of increasing resolution. Uh, and it's also the reason that you would want to have an electron column that's, you know, relatively tall. Uh, the reason these devices aren't short and squat is because um, optically it works out a lot better if the, uh, if the electron gun is farther away. And for a similar reason, picture tubes in TVs are set up that way too. Uh, the electron source has to be sort of far away in order for the deflection and focusing to work. Uh, so after the electron beam passes through that lens, there is a set of deflection plates. So we are looking at it uh, so that you can see this bottom set of plates, um, you know, edge on, and the top set of plates are side on. So it looks like there's just one plate there, but it's actually the same in both axes. 
And uh, by putting a voltage difference across those plates, we can control how the electron beam is scanned across. So the voltages are pretty low compared to the rest of the system. It's just about a few hundred volts across the plates there at most. Um, and the lower the voltage differential, the less the electron beam moves. And then we, uh, this is actually another lens, this top plate with a, there's an insulator, but there's another uh, electrode in there and a, an electrode here. That's the focus for the beam that focuses the electrons down. And finally, they actually hit the sample, which in this case is uh, that little lock washer there. Just that little tiny washer. And when they hit the washer, uh, they emit a cloud of secondary electrons. And this is the signal that a scanning electron microscope actually um, senses. And we'll talk about how that thing is, how the electron cloud is sensed in, in just a minute. So here's that lock washer, and this was the thing that I used to actually test this whole thing out today, um, just because it's a very simple object and it's conductive, but I'll get into that later. So we were talking about slamming electrons into this thing. Uh, the whole point of this electron column with the copper pipe and everything is just to get a very fine, very tightly focused beam of electrons to hit the target, in this case, that lock washer. And when you get a, an electron beam to hit something, uh, b by physics, you, you release more electrons from the surface of that object. So the way this works is the beam is scanned across the target object, and these resulting sort of secondary electrons, as they're called, is sensed by this device. Um, this, this particular one is called an Everhart Thornley detector. And the way it works is by attracting those secondary electrons that are liberated from the surface of the object over to here. And it does that by putting a voltage on this cage. And inside here, there is a, a phosphor, just like the coating on a television screen or an oscilloscope. And when those electrons are attracted over here, they're, they're accelerated and slammed into that phosphor, creating a little flash of light. And the flash of light is conducted through a, an acrylic light guide. And then up into here, where there's a photomultiplier tube, which is really just a, a, uh, a fancy device that can sense very low light levels. So what we end up is with a, a, a flickering sort of light that's being sensed by the photomultiplier inside here. And the reason this plastic bag is on is, is just to keep stray light out. So the way an image is formed uh, is by synchronizing the scanning that's going on in this electron microscope with the scanning that's going on on our display device, which is an oscilloscope in this case. So as the electron beam is scanned across the surface of our sample, it's also scanned across the surface of the oscilloscope. And the signal that we get from the secondary electron detector is routed to the oscilloscope's uh, brightness, basically, the beam brightness on the oscilloscope. So when we're getting a, as the beam moves across, when it's in a position where it's getting a strong signal, the oscilloscope will be bright in that spot on the screen. And when it moves into a region where there's not much signal coming out, the oscilloscope will be darker in that region. So an electron microscope, a scanning electron microscope doesn't actually form an image in the microscope like a light microscope does it actually scans across and just sends that, that information out through this secondary electron detector. Okay, so let's take a look at the front panel here. We've got all kinds of cool knobs and uh, gauges to look at. I'll just start at the top. This uh, top uh, segment controls the filament uh, and the electron gun of the device. So this knob controls uh, bias voltage, which regulates how much current actually comes out of the electron gun. And this knob controls the filament temperature. Uh, the next one down is the um, raster scan generator. So this is what actually applies voltages to those deflection plates. And there's controls for um, X and Y scale and offset. So in both axes, you can control where the scanning is happening and how big the scan is. And this is actually what controls the magnification of the microscope. So if the scan is very small, 
the, the magnification is high because the uh, size on the oscilloscope screen is constant. So if the scan size gets progressively smaller and smaller, the overall magnification goes higher and higher, um, which is, you would think it would actually be, you would take more voltage or more signal or something to get a higher magnification, but it's actually the other way around. Smaller deflections and smaller voltages uh, lead to higher magnifications. Okay, and the, this, this is the, the X and Y signals that are output to the oscilloscope so that the microscope scanning is synchronized with the oscilloscope display. Okay, the next one down is the uh, secondary electron detector control. So this controls the voltage on that, the wire mesh cage. Uh, it's usually about between zero and 500 volts. Uh, this is the main accelerating voltage for the phosphor screen. That's usually about 10,000 volts. This is the focus voltage. That could be a eh, couple thousand volts. It depends on the uh, accelerating voltage. Uh, th these two bottom things are commercially made supplies. Uh, in fact, this one was the one that actually inspired this whole project, but we'll get to that. This is a, uh, <laughs> a high voltage supply for the photomultiplier tube and that uses anywhere between 500 and 1500 volts. You can actually control the sensitivity or the gain of the photomultiplier tube by adjusting its supply voltage. And this is the main accelerating voltage for the electron gun. And it's set to six kilovolts now, but it could be anywhere from zero to 10 on this supply. And commercial scanning electron microscopes actually go anywhere from a couple hundred volts all the way up to 30 or 40 kilovolts even. The vacuum system is two parts. This is a mechanical pump, uh, pretty self-explanatory. It's just it uses mechanical means to actually remove most of the air from the chamber. Um, but in order to get an electron beam working efficiently, there needs to be an additional vacuum pump, which is hiding behind these hoses here. It's kind of hard to see. This is called a oil diffusion pump and it has no moving parts, what it does is it actually boils oil and uses the vapor depth to push more air out of the chamber. So I'll probably do a whole video just on this by itself. The, the basic idea is that it, it's very um, easy to deal with since it has no moving parts. And it's, it only has one drawback, which is that the boiling oil can get up into the vacuum chamber, which is bad because you know it'd make a mess and cover everything. So to get around that problem, there's a water-cooled baffle. These are just foam-insulated rubber hoses. And I'm using my uh, window air conditioner water chiller uh, concoction over here to um, condense the stray oil vapors and get them to drip back down into the pump instead of contaminating the vacuum chamber. So the big success today was that I finally formed an image with this microscope. Up until today, uh, I've just been you know, doing preliminary tests and um, figuring out how the electron beam was actually moving. It's, it's actually a very difficult thing to do because you can't see the electron beam. The only way to, to tell what's happening is to put a phosphor screen in the, in the path of the beam. And that's, uh, I've been using this oscilloscope screen that I cut off it's coated with a green phosphor. So I've been putting that into the microscope so that I can see what's going on. Otherwise, you have no idea where the beam is. And uh, if this you know, project generates some interest, I'll do a video on all the problems I ran into. But it basically took you know, two, two or three months here to, um, <laughs> to get the beam under control and, and working the way I was you know, hoping that it would. Um, so. <laughs> So today we finally got an image and basically all the parts of this system are working even though we, we still have quite a few refinements to go through. At least the image is there and I, I can start refining it now. So all the parts are at least you know, working as, as planned. So let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any questions uh, or if this project is interesting to you and uh, I'll probably make more videos. I don't think I'm gonna write up really detailed instructions unless, unless the response is quite large. Uh, but I'll certainly make more videos and, um, uh, you know, make some great pictures, actually, once this thing starts working a little better. Okay, see you next time. Bye.